Don't let YouTube decide what information you get. That's your choice. YouTube is deleting our videos and cuts you off from a source of honest reporting. Make sure you don't lose access to NTD's news content and take a quick moment to subscribe to our newsletter so no matter what happens here, you'll keep your access to a trustworthy news source. China comes under fire again for subjecting foreigners to an invasive virus test. Japanese officials say it needs to stop. The head of the Chinese Communist Party is determined to stand against democratic principles. He vows not to follow constitutionalism. Florida's governor takes new action to protect the state from China's communist influence. And one Chinese sailor is speaking out against the Chinese regime. That's after traveling around the world opened his eyes. Welcome to China In Focus, I'm Tiffany Meyer. China is once again coming under fire for using an invasive virus test method on foreigners, this time with Japanese citizens. Japan is asking China to stop using the anal swab method to test Japanese citizens for the CCP virus. But authorities said Monday they haven't gotten a response. According to Chief Cabinet Secretary Katsunobu Kato, a number of Japanese citizens currently in China reported receiving the tests to the embassy. They say the procedure causes psychological harm. It's unclear how many Japanese citizens were affected. Chinese officials faced similar backlash recently after using the same tests on U.S. diplomats stationed in China. The U.S. State Department told the Epoch Times that Chinese authorities later claimed the tests were performed in error. Though last week, China's foreign ministry denied that U.S. officials had been required to take the test. Back in January, some South Korean citizens were also asked to endure the procedure after arriving in China. They were able to avoid it after their embassy stepped in. They provided fecal samples for examination instead. Beijing claims the anal swab test to deliver more accurate results than nasal or throat swabs. A former State Department official is slamming the Chinese regime for not taking biosafety seriously. Miles Yu served as senior China policy advisor to then Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. In an interview with Voice of America, Yu criticized the CCP's virus research in the past decade. He says after the SARS pandemic in 2003, the Chinese regime doubled down on its effort to find the origins of the virus. Over the past decade, Chinese scientists found almost 2,000 new viruses. It took the rest of the world 200 years to find that many. But Yu says biosafety practices at Chinese labs aren't up to par. Then director of the Wuhan Institute of Virology admitted in 2018 that China's biology labs have some common problems. They include lack of safety requirements and technical support. Yu says it's dangerous to do this amount of virus research in such an environment, and it would be hard to avoid disastrous lab accidents. But the Chinese Communist regime is not taking the potential cost seriously. Beijing police are reportedly ramping up suppression of petitioners and those seeking justice from the regime. That's ahead of the Chinese Communist Party's annual two sessions meeting. It's the most important political meeting of the year for Beijing and kicks off this Thursday. But it seems there's more happening to prep for the event than just what's on the schedule. We look at what happened to three petitioners who went to the capital to defend their rights. Jiang Jiawen is from the northeast province of Liaoning. He told the Epoch Times Chinese language edition last Friday that five Beijing police officers have been knocking at his door and windows asking to be let in. Jiang says the officers came twice a day every day since last Tuesday. These five police are from the Petition Bureau in Liaoning Province. They are believed to have come all the way to Beijing in order to bring him back to his hometown. China's Petition Bureaus are local departments responsible for accepting complaints and petitions for change from citizens, often from those seeking justice. Aided by Beijing police, the five officers from Jiang's hometown eventually broke into his home, forced him into a police car and drove him back to Liaoning. Jiang has been petitioning for about 20 years. In 2001, Jiang was severely injured after the head of a local factory picked a fight with him. But the company leader later bribed the police to escape punishment. Instead, Jiang was charged with what authorities called disturbing public order for petitioning for justice over his injury. He was also sent to work in a labor camp four times. Another petitioner, Li Chao Shu, is from the southwestern province of Sichuan. She also came to Beijing to file her petition. 
On Friday, she was reportedly kidnapped by seven or eight men on the streets of Beijing. The man claimed to be from the Public Security Bureau. Li was then pushed into a car, and Sichuan officials took her back to her hometown. According to other petitioners, Li was injured and seen crying while being abducted. Yet another petitioner is named Zhao Chenhong from Beijing's neighboring province of Hebei. She was followed by local authorities in Beijing and forcibly taken back to her hometown by police officers last Thursday. Zhao told the Epoch Times that she went to Beijing with several farmers. They all had their land taken away by authorities with little to no compensation. The farmers had already been taken back to their hometown before Zhao. She said Chinese authorities use their power to stand above the law, adding that they don't actually solve problems, but rather persecute people who draw attention to the issues. The CCP is determined to stand against the rule of law and democratic principles. That's according to CCP head Xi Jinping's speech at a party meeting last November. A magazine of the party revealed the details of the speech over the weekend. This is the first time such speeches were made available to the public. In his speech, Xi strongly criticized some Chinese human rights lawyers for their, quote, poor political consciousness and malicious attacks on the political system and the rule of law of the CCP. Poor political consciousness is a term the CCP invented. It means the person is not in line with communist ideology. Attacking the political system and the rule of law of the CCP means the human rights lawyers do not adhere to the orders of the CCP. She also said in his speech that Communist China will never take the course of Western countries that have a constitutional form of government, with separations of power and judicial independence. He added, saying the CCP should have absolute control over the judicial system. Back in 2017, the president of the CCP's Supreme Court also said the same. Art performances in Communist China will have to now serve socialism and show support for Communist Party policies. This according to a list of guidelines by the regime's cultural ministry. These guidelines came into effect on Monday. The guidelines are published by the Cultural Ministry's Association of Performing Arts. They apply to performers in all categories of live entertainment, including acrobatics, theater, music, and dance. The guidelines hint that the CCP may politicize the performance arts industry. One guideline says that live performers should support the party's political direction and policies. Another amounts to saying that they must love communist China. The regulation also tells performers to, quote, uphold the idea that literature and art should serve the people and socialism. That idea is based on former CCP leader Mao Zedong's ideology. The regulation also claims jurisdiction over performers' faith. It requires performers to align with the CCP's policies on religion. The CCP is officially atheist. Performers who fail to comply with these guidelines could potentially face a permanent ban from their profession. The regulation may be subject to future revision. A Chinese sailor is standing up and speaking out against the Chinese regime. That's after traveling around the world opened his eyes to the truth about communist propaganda. NTD's Becky Zhou has the details. A Chinese man has visited over 30 countries since becoming a sailor in 2015. His travels have opened his eyes to what life and the shipping industry is really like under Chinese communist rule. Haibin Liang says Chinese authorities have banned sailors from returning to China since the pandemic started. The captain seized our passports, certificates and all other documents and won't allow us to keep them ourselves. Under Chinese policy, sailors have to pass various inspections and test negative for the virus before visiting their family members in China. But it's hard to get tested at sea. Many sailors have had no choice but to continue drifting in the ocean for over a year, even though they're not infected. We are healthy. We want a vacation. We want freedom. We want human rights. The sailors are also deprived of their human rights in other ways. They're made to work in small, confined cabin spaces with little ventilation, and even encounter pirates. Those burdens come on top of the already high risk sailors normally face. The number of Chinese sailors who've died at sea is considered a state secret. Liang says he barely makes ends meet, though he risks his life to be a sailor. His company currently owes him seven months' worth of paychecks. 
One clause of his employment contract prevents him from filing complaints with the union, called the International Transport Workers Federation. Maritime transport accounts for 80 percent of international trade due to high costs of air transportation. The industry relies on sailors to ship commercial goods to all corners of the world. Despite their contribution to China's economy, sailors are seen as having a low social status and often receive few social benefits. Governments of other countries do a good job protecting the rights of sailors, but the Chinese Communist Party does not. Though the job does have its perks, one main advantage of being a sailor, Liang can easily travel abroad. Liang used the privilege to flee China last July, three months after publicly criticizing the regime. Our country and our government is being eroded by an evil force step by step. The people are going through an ordeal. I am determined to fight against this evil regime until the end, no matter where I am. To avoid persecution in China, he since applied for refugee status in Australia. Reporting by Becky Zhou, NTD News. Another famous privately owned Chinese company is selling part of its stake to state investors. Suning is one of the largest privately owned appliance retailers in China. But now the sale has turned the business into yet another of China's state-controlled enterprises. The company's stock shares jumped by their daily maximum limit of 10 percent on Monday. Following its announcement that government-backed investors in Shenzhen City would purchase an over 20 percent stake. The stock purchase is valued at over $2 billion. Shenzhen City authorities will control the company's take more than any other shareholder. Financial scholar Si Ling says it's a shame Suning was forced to take the step because of its debts. During an interview with Radio Free Asia, he said the move is not a surprise. Ling said Chinese authorities' decision to step in is a sign of the growing appetite of the Chinese state. He added that Suning is being forced to cooperate and make compromises with the regime if it wants to survive. In recent years, the scale of private enterprises in China is gradually shrinking, while the state capital is boldly marching forward. An executive from another privately owned company expressed concerns over the move to Radio Free Asia. That person who has to stay anonymous says Suning's transformation from private to state owned is sure to fail. He says state ownership first destroys the original private company, then goes on to destroy itself, adding that a regime-run monopoly is certain to lead to a collapse. Suning's major stock sale isn't the only indicator of the retailer's financial trouble. A professional sports club owned by Suning seized operations over the weekend. The association, called Jiangsu FC, is a member of the Chinese Soccer Super League. The soccer club announced the change and expressed hope for new backers on Sunday by a post on its official WeChat account. Fans were caught off guard by the news as the club just won the Chinese Super League title for the first time in November. Last month, the retail giant said it plans to focus on its core businesses, a move that might leave its non-retail assets at risk. Suning also owns Italian professional soccer club Inter Milan. The club had previously signed contracts with foreign soccer stars before Suning's financial issues escalated. Brazilian player Alex Teixeira chose to join the soccer club on a $60 million deal in 2016. But now financial problems resulting from China's pandemic lockdowns have taken a major toll, both on the athletics clubs and their backers. Another Biden nominee is getting attention for past remarks on China. Victoria Newland is a veteran diplomat and nominated for the third highest post in the State Department. President Biden tapped Newland to be Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. During a press conference in 2012, a reporter asked her about a CCP-funded program. She was a spokesperson for the State Department at the time. Are you concerned about the Confucius Institute's expansion in the U.S.? As the Are we concerned about? The Confucius Institute's expansion in the U.S. as the strongest Chinese soft power. No, uh, this is something that we support. It's part of the people-to-people -people understanding. We just want to make sure that the visa categories are correct. A Chinese regime agency runs the Confucius Institute. On the surface, it's a cultural and language program. But the State Department says it promotes Beijing's propaganda on American campuses. Beijing does not allow instructions at these institutions to teach sensitive topics like Hong Kong. 
And oftentimes, these instructors have to follow Chinese law even on U.S. soil. Last year, the Senate passed a bill that seeks to reduce Confucius Institute's influence in the U.S. And in January, Republican senators grilled a Biden nominee for giving a paid speech at a Confucius Institute in 2019. Newland might have to face some tough questions during her upcoming confirmation hearing. The Florida governor is sending a warning to the Chinese Communist Party. He is vowing to protect the state from Chinese Communist influence. NTD's Allison Lee has the story. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is unveiling sweeping new laws that confront hostile influence from the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP. We need to take action, stand firm against the Chinese Communist Party and foreign influence and interference in American research, education, and public affairs. Today, Florida will take a leading role by proposing important steps to address past, current, and future concerns of the Chinese Communist Party and other foreign influence in the governmental, economic, and academic affairs of our state. The Republican governor highlights intellectual property theft and corporate espionage operations by the CCP. He says the CCP poses one of the greatest threats to American security and prosperity. Over the last decade, the Communist Party of China has been meticulous and deliberate in their economic infiltration across the globe. The growing presence of the Chinese Communist Party influence in domestic and international affairs is one of the most pervasive threats to American security and prosperity. According to the new proposal, universities must establish a strict vetting process for foreigners applying for research positions. Schools and state agencies must also report gifts of more than $50,000 from foreign governments. The Chinese Communist Party has made it a mission of their global expansion of power to steal intellectual property from our businesses, our government, and our academic institutions, all to further fuel their global objectives. Schools that violate the rules will have to pay 105 percent of the undisclosed amount to the state. To combat corporate espionage, there will be longer sentence terms. The offense will also be reclassified one degree higher. We'll place strategic safeguards against foreign influence by closing loopholes, strengthening institutional vetting, and applying common sense protections for Florida schools, government entities, and more. DeSantis says Florida will be a leader in bringing these issues into the sunlight. Reporting by Allison Lee, NTD News. The Chinese regime is adding the CCP virus pandemic to the tools of suppression against press freedom. This according to the Foreign Correspondents Club of China, or FCCC. It says the CCP limited foreign reporting in 2020 with virus prevention measures, intimidation and visa curbs. The club also says this led to a rapid decline in media freedom. In its annual report, the FCCC says no foreign journalist said working conditions in China had improved. This happened for the third year in a row. The report included responses from 150 reporters. It also says the Chinese regime denied reporters access to sensitive areas and threatened them with enforced quarantine. The CCP has also been using visa restrictions to pressure reporters for many years. The FCCC report says last year more than 10 correspondents were given visas valued only for six months or less. But the most common media visas are usually for one year. The regime's foreign ministry responded to the report, saying these claims are, quote, baseless. The CCP expelled more than a dozen U.S. journalists in 2020. Chinese investment in Australia fell by over 60 percent last year. It's the lowest level recorded in six years. This comes as the two countries' diplomatic dispute worsens. Emery McCarthy reports. As tensions between Beijing and Canberra continue to simmer, Chinese investment in Australia has slumped to its lowest level in six years. The annual tracking study from the Australian National University recorded 1 billion Australian dollars of Chinese investment in 2020, consisting of real estate, mining and manufacturing deals. That's a 61 per cent fall, larger than the 42 per cent decrease in foreign direct investment globally. Australia announced a shake-up of its foreign investment laws in 2020 to give the government the power to veto or force the sale of a business if it creates a national security risk. 
Chinese company Meng Yu abandoned a deal to buy the Australian dairy firm Lion Dairy and Drinks from Japanese company Kirin in August, after the Australian government indicated it would block the sale. The Chinese embassy said in November that 10 Chinese investments had been blocked in Australia on national security grounds. China has since imposed dumping tariffs on Australian wine and barley and restricted the unloading of Australian coal at Chinese ports. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.